Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you uh, this morning to our midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in. We want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here at Grace Life Bible Church on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider ringing the alarm bell and subscribing so that you can stay current with the ministry when we go live from the Assembly Building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content for you here midweek. I'd like to extend a warm Happy New Year greeting to everybody. And I uh, need to apologize. It's been a few weeks since I've made a midweek video. And my reasons are mostly related to just sort of needing a break over the Christmas holiday. We had family visiting from out of town and just didn't have time the week between Christmas and New Year's to make a video. And then last week we started the new semester at school. And so I just uh, didn't have time the last two weeks to make a video. So we want to try to get uh, back into the habit of doing that here this week. So again, I want to welcome you to the channel. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe, ring the alarm bell to stay current. Featured book this week is again my book, The King James Bible in America, an orthographic, historical, and textual investigation. If you're interested in the printed history of the King James text in the United States, please consider picking up a copy of this book and supporting the ministry in that way if you're so inclined. We would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt tech site to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites or just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and checking us out here on Rumble. So those of you that are following this channel, you know that of late in these midweek videos, I have been responding or giving my thoughts to the Textual Confidence Collective. And this playlist is now currently up to 15 episodes. The last midweek video that I released was video number 15 in this playlist looking at, um, is it true that textual variants don't impact doctrine? And those of you who watch that know that I have, I promised a forthcoming video uh, on that topic and we will get to that. What I want to do in this video is I want to give a summary this past Sunday at church, we had a technical malfunction as I was teaching uh, lesson 189 in my From This Generation Forever class, which was a, which is about the AV 1611 and the first edition and the he-she Bible controversy. And I, I want to make this video to sort of fill in the gap that we lost from that video. So um, I'm, I'm going to just hit some high points here. If anybody's interested in reading the full content, uh, you need to check out the description under this video where you can access these notes. Um, but I want to make a video to kind of fill in that spot so Sunday we can move on uh, with this information. So we will get to responding further, giving further thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective in the next video. This video is sort of a redo of the one that I lost from Sunday. It's very frustrating. Uh, we use a Mibu camera at church in the Sunday school classroom to live stream. And I updated the firmware. And I didn't realize that when I did that, um, all of my subscriptions to the streaming software uh, kind of like reset or something, did something weird. And so I taught the whole lesson Sunday, lesson 189, not realizing that I wasn't streaming. And then, of course, not realizing that I also neglected to set up a backup camera so anyway, just uh, never-ending frustration when it comes to issues related to streaming, and etc. But we're going to try to fill in that gap here in this particular video. So as the title suggests, we talked Sunday about the first edition of the 1611 and the he-she Bible controversy. All right. Now, leading up to that, in Lesson 187, again, I'll leave a link to the description uh, in the description for this video, we talked about uh, confronting the copyright myth and early 17th century printing. Uh, to talk about what the nature of printing was like in the early 17th century when the King James Bible was first printed in 1611. We talk about that here in Lesson 187. After I respond further, give some further thoughts to something I had said earlier about 1 Corinthians 12, 28, um, and whether or not Anglican bishops uh, messed with that verse. So if you're interested in that, please check that out. And then more recently in Lesson 188, um, I gave some more thoughts on the copyright controversy, and then we looked at a 1612 New Testament. And that's because some viewers sent me some information. Here's a license that was printed in the front of a Bible 
um, expressly giving a publisher permission to print the text under the jurisdiction of the British Crown, which is one of the things that we were talking about. So if you want to know more about that, again, check out Lesson 188. Then also in Lesson 188, we looked at a 1612 New Testament that was printed and in the following year in 1612 and looked at some of the interesting things about this. The reason I spent time on that was to answer some questions that had come up by somebody in class. So we appreciate those viewers uh, sending us that information. So let's get into what we discussed now in Lesson 189. Okay, so I'm going to read some of this. Some of this I'm going to cut short. I'm going to show you some things. Uh, this isn't probably going to be the full exhaustive same presentation that I gave on Sunday, but it will definitely be good enough to fill in the gap that is missing from that video having been lost. So <clears throat> the first point here is that discrepancies exist between how many print runs were published in 1611 and how to understand the difference between them or whether they constitute wholly different editions or different printings of the same edition. So let me just comment on that briefly. So in the publishing world, you have to distinguish between editions and printings. So here's my book, my featured book, The King James Bible in America. This was published in 2019. All right. There have been two different printings of it, but there is still only one edition. So in other words, I have not made up to this point major changes. I've not added new content. I've not stricken content. Um, it, the book, there have been, you know, spelling changes and corrections of some typos and those kinds of things, but the content of the book has not changed. So it has not gone through a, what, what we would consider to be a second edition. So there have been multiple printings of the first edition. When it comes to the 1611 King James Bible, okay, um, there's a lot of, uh, some gray areas about, how many printings were made in 1611 and then should those be viewed as different printings or different editions these things are debated in the literature amongst the historians and the linguists that are looking at this topic okay so first first published in 1611 the authorized version was published exclusively as a large folio edition all right uh, gordon campbell says a large a large sorry a folio is a large book and the first edition of the King James was large, even by usual standard standard of folios. Thick pages measure approximately 11 inches by 16 inches. It was a heavy volume designed to sit on a lectern in a church. As the title pages explain, it was, quote, appointed to be read in the churches. Now, if you follow the videos in this series, you know that I have a, a leaf from a 1611 folio edition. It is a extremely big page. So when, when he's talking here, Campbell, about 11 inches by 16 inches, this is the dynamics. It's bigger than the window here that I have on my uh, video. And it came from this book right here by Willoughby, um, The Making of the King James Bible. There were only 290 copies of Willoughby's book made because one of the reasons is because each one had a, a different leaf from a 1611. So the 1611 was only published in a large folio, and it was designed to sit on the lectern in a church to be the church Bible that was read during the church service, okay? Now, Brake, Donald Brake, this is an important book here, okay? I'll show this book to you just briefly. This is an important book. Okay, a monarch's majestic translation, the King James Bible, the remarkable relevance of a 17th century book to the 21st century. And then it says, includes a worldwide census of extant 1611 he Bibles. Okay, so if you're going to study this topic, Brake's book here is extremely important because he has done a lot of great work looking in to some of the um, some of the controversies and some of the ambiguities that exist around this topic of how many were printed, the he-she controversy, which we'll get to in a minute, and a few other things. So you're definitely going to want to pick up a copy of Brake's book if you're really interested in diving deep <clears throat> into the subject matter. But Brake says, there were five folio editions, all with nearly interchangeable leaves word for word. 
So there was a large folio, okay? So again, that's this size here, big size. There was a large folio in 1611, 1613, 1617, 1634, and 1639, 40, somewhere in there. A smaller folio edition was printed in 1613, had 72 lines per page instead of 59 lines uh, of the other folio editions. So it was a little smaller. The smaller edition reduced the total pages from 738 to, 50, to 508. Uh, the print of each page of the 59 line editions used the same number of lines word for word, line for line. For line. This enabled the printer to substitute reprinted pages when errors surfaced. However, the careful compression, careful comparison, excuse me, reveals many leaves have differences, mostly minor. If the printer needed additional copies, he used leaves left over from previous printings. There is uh, this, no doubt, led to missed copies, as Fry pointed out. There's a lot of technical stuff there that breaks getting into here, but what you need to realize is that the the work in the print shop of Robert Barker, the King's printer, is extremely sort of, uh, I don't want to say it's unorganized, but it's chaotic, okay? Um, and I covered that again in this lesson here, lesson 187, we were talking about early 17th century printing. So there's all kinds of moving things going on here, okay? It seems to be the case that the print, that the text is being printed in multiple different print shops, and there's leaves left over from private pre or previous printings that end up in later printings. And there's a lot of different things here, a lot of different moving pieces when we think about the, the printing of the text in early 17th century England. Okay, Now, <clears throat> there's controversy surrounding how many folio editions of the AV were published in 1611. A.S. Herbert's Historical Catalog of Printed Editions of the English Bible, 1525 to 1961, contains two entries for the year 1611. So this abbreviation here, DMH, is short for, and I'll show you this on the screen. I do have the original, um, there was an edition of this published in 1903 by Darrow and Mole, okay? In 1968, it was redone and expanded by A.S. Herbert, all right? So when you see this coding or abbreviation, where to go, DMH, it is referring to the catalog of Darrow, Mull, and Herbert, the most recent edition, the one from 1968 that was released by Herbert. Well, he, could, he has two different entries in the year 1611, entry 309 and entry 310. Gordon Campbell argues that the great he and she editions date from 1611. So this is where things get a little bit confusing, all right? So I'm going to cut to the chase on this. Um, FHA Scrivener in the late 19th century said in one of the books that he released that the he Bible was the second edition and the she Bible was the first edition, all right? While later scholars have analyzed the situation and have determined that they think that Scrivener was wrong. So when Campbell is about to say in this quote is he's following Scrivener and he's going to say that the She Bible is the first, the first printing of the first edition and the He Bible is the second printing of the first edition. All right. Now, there's reasons to disagree with that. And we will try to give you some, some reasons for that, okay? So this is what Campbell says. <clears throat> there were two folio editions of the King James Version published in 1611. They are known as the He Bible and the She Bible. So see very clearly, Campbell says that the He Bible and the She Bible are both coming from 1611. The names arise from a well-known crux at Ruth 3.15, one 1611 Bible reads, he went into the city, referring to Boaz. The other reads, she went into the city, referring to Ruth. The difficulty is that the Hebrew text has he, but the sense of the passage demands that Ruth, rather than Boaz, go into the city. Setting aside the questions of which version is correct, it is now clear 
that that two that the earlier of the two Bibles is the He Bible, and the translators seem to rip deliberately to have changed the pronoun from she in the Bishop's Bible. Okay, now, excuse me, Campbell says a couple different things there. All right, um, that I think we need to sort of unpack. Let's first unpack the he she Bible difference. All right, so let's look at it. So here's Ruth three fifteen from a sixteen eleven, and notice the end of the verse. And laid it on laid it on her, and he went into the city. So here's he went into the city. Other printings have she went into the city. The next verse says, and when she came to uh, came to her mother in law, uh, that said. So no, notice that in verse sixteen, it's Ruth going to her mother in law. Um. And at the end of the previous verse, they have he, referring to Boaz, went into the city. Or at least that's the printing, okay? Now, if we go back to Campbell, notice what Campbell's saying. He, he's saying, he's first noting the fact that there's a that there are t printing variants between uh, different editions of Ruth, and, and he's calling it he, she, based upon what they have in Ruth 3.15, okay? And then notice what he says, setting aside the question of which version is correct, that would be, should it read he or should it read she? It is now clear that the earlier of the two Bibles is the he Bible, and the translators seem to deliberately to have changed the pronoun from she in the Bishop's Bible. So let's look at that quick, okay? We can look at a 1602 Bishop's Bible, which is the base text for the King James, okay? And notice what it says. And laid it on her neck, and she got her into the city, all right? And we can look at the 1611. And we can find the verse and lay um, and he and he would and he sorry <laughs> and laid it on her neck and he went into the city. Okay, so what Campbell is saying and what David Norton says is that the translators intentionally switched he she to he. So again, here's the here's the sixteen o two. It clearly says right here uh, where I'm. And she got her into the city. He went into the city. So Campbell is saying that the translators intentionally altered that reading. All right. So I've looked at uh, I looked at uh, some of Jacob's uh, Doctor Jacob's stuff on on uh, Bod sixteen o two, and I I don't see where um, I don't see where he notes that Bod sixteen o two recorded any changes. So if there was a change here. It would have had to be at the uh, general meeting or the meeting of final review at Stationers Hall, which was the last toll gate the text went through before it went to the printer. OK, um, I just I just question that. OK, and let me show you some reasons why. So let's look at some thing, things. So here's Ruth 315. This is from the Wycliffe Bible. Notice it's hard to read. It's in Middle English. I would maintain that this is the word she. And enter ride in the city. So all the way back to Wycliffe, the reading was she. Tyndall, of course, never translated the book of Ruth um, that, that we know of. But we could look at Coverdale, okay, and laid it on her neck, and she went into the city. So Coverdale has she. Matthews, we could look at the Matthews Bible, and she got her into the city. Great Bible from 1539. We could, we could look at this one as well. And she got her into the city. Geneva Bible. We could look at the Geneva Bible from uh, 1560. And she went into the city. The bishops, which is the base text, which we already saw from the PDF. And she got her into the city. And we could look at the Douay Reims and see again. Um, and she carried it and went into the city. So all of the English Bibles prior to 1611 have she went into the city as a reference to Ruth, okay? Then all of a sudden you you find in the 1611, the reading, he went into the city, all right? And then the question comes, well, is that an intentional reading on the part of the translators or is that a printer error, all right? We go to the base text of 1602. We see it said she. There does not seem to be anything that was changed in Bod 1602 related to Ruth 315. So if there was a change by the translators, it would have had to have come 
later in the stage of translation, probably at the general meeting. Now, I am going to say to you that I am extremely doubtful in this case that the translators intended it to be he. Even if we look at modern versions, okay, so let's just load up some modern versions briefly. We're going to go to Blue Letter Bible to do this, and we search Ruth 315. Even in modern versions, you'll see that they, many of them, most notably the ESV and the uh, New American Standard, are going to read in that verse, she. And the reason for that is because that makes the most sense. The text makes the most sense when it says she in 315, because in the next verse, we see Ruth going in and talking to Naomi. So let's switch this from the King James, and let's look at the ESV here for Ruth 3. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if we go to Ruth 315, here's the ESV. Notice, then she went into the city. And notice that the ESV doesn't even have a footnote here. They read she. So the, the reason it reads she is because that's what makes the most sense when you read it in English, right? Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said. So it's Ruth who is doing the action and the activity here. So the text makes the most sense when it says she, not he. So I'm not convinced at all that the King James translators intended or made the intentional choice to say he there instead of she in the first edition. Okay, we can look at, again, the New American Standard, as I said, and let's just load this up and look at this one too. The New American Standard, I've already looked at this, also has she, but notice there's a footnote on she in the New American Standard. And if you go down to verse 15, many manuscripts have he, okay? So oh, it's a long-winded way of saying that that's where the controversy stems from, all right? Which printing is the first one? The one that had he in Ruth 3.15 or the one that had she in Ruth 3.15? So unfortunately, these two Bibles become almost wholly known by the variant in printing at that spot. And let me be clear. It's my belief that I, I'm not convinced that the translators intentionally made this change. It seems to me that this is a printer mistake in the first edition, okay, of the 1611. Dr. Brake, um, Dr. Brake, author of A Visual History of the King James Bible, that's a different book by by break also comments upon the peculiarity he says one issue that has fascinated scholars for years is the inconsistency and in wording between the so-called he and she editions of the king james these terms have become synonymous with the first and second editions of the king james version based upon the ruth 315 reading and she went into the city found in one edition or sorry he went into the city found in one edition and she went into the city found in the other Scholars have generally determined that the he reading of Ruth 3.15 is the reading of the first edition, and the she reading is the reading of the second edition. So that's what I think. These guys have convinced me that the he reading was the first edition, all right, and that the he reading was a printer error. That is my belief. But the he reading is the first edition. The she reading was a was later to try to correct the printer error at Ruth three fifteen. Okay, end note chapter end note number nine for chapter eight. This is from Brake's book, A Visual History of the King James Bible, on page two sixty six. Reads: It is common to refer to the sixteen eleven edition as the first edition, first issue and the 1613 edition as the first edition, second issue. But we are using first edition and second edition based on David Norton's convincing argument that the 1613 edition is a genuine second edition. So now let's talk about that. The She Bible that corrects the printer error dates from 1613. So the title page on the She Bible, where the error is fixed in Ruth 3.15, dates from 1613. So what is going on here is, as this has been cleared up, and people have, like Brake, have spent hours tracking down the extant copies of all of this and cataloging what's going on, they have determined that 
1611 first edition is the he bible first folio edition and then there was a second folio edition printed in 1613 that fixed the mistake at Ruth 315 okay and Herbert addresses this in his catalog. Now, I'm not going to read all this. You should read this, though. If you're interested in this, this gets technical. It gets into the surveys of these that have been done historically. And you can see a lot has been written about trying to uncover this. And Scrivener has thrown some real sort of wingers in here because of the way he was approaching this. Scrivener was approaching this from the point of view of a text critic not from the point of view of somebody who is trying to understand printing history and techniques in early 17th century. So Scrivener, the, Scrivener said that because Scrivener, you know, is viewed as an authority on this issue, he said the opposite. He said the She Bible was the first edition and the He Bible was the second edition. Well, what Herbert's talking about here what Timothy Berg talks about in the stuff that I quote from him, from his yet unpublished um, essay on this, and what Brake is talking about, and what David Norton is talking about, is the fact that Scrivener was wrong. Scrivener was wrong in assigning the She Bible to being the first edition from 1611. He got it backwards, and the reason he got it backwards is because he was not thinking about it he was thinking about it as a text critic. He was not thinking about it as somebody coming from the point of view of printing during that time. Okay. Now, even Willoughby. So Willoughby, at the front of his monograph, says right here, it's going to be hard for you to see this, okay? But he talks right here on this page. So you can see this is a really oversized book because it's a folio size. He says right here on this page, he says, an original leaf, from the great she bible of 1611 so willoughby bought scrivener's explanations he thought scrivener was right okay so he says that this is a page from a 1611 she bible and what 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 has been uncovered now is that the she bible is actually the second edition where the printer error was fixed and that it dates from 1613 okay now what I just did is summarize about three pages of notes covering a whole bunch of stuff related to this. Now, you should read this because the notes explain the, the confusion and Scrivener's role, and they go into a lot of details that I'm not necessarily going to cover here in this video, okay? Now, the and we also I also quote from Norton here. There is one thing, though, that I do want to talk about related uh, that, that uh, Brother Berg brought up in his yet unpublished lecture and he said and he says that the nicknames he she are completely unhelpful okay so let's see what he says these titles have unfortunately stuck perhaps because it is more romantic and dramatic way to describe them numerous king james bible scholars have complained about these designations pollard and norton among them and they really should go away and then he gives some reasons for why the she he bible distinctions should go away okay first the distinctions give the misleading impression that there were that there were two sorry that there are two i can't read that the two are some kind of pair they're not they're not a pair they're they're, they're different editions and we say that because they make other they make they vary from each other in other spots other than ruth 3 15 okay um, so he, he talks about this and, and, and why that's important. Second, the designations give the mistaken impression that this is the only variant between them. That's not true. There are other variants. So, you know, you're printing the text in, in early, um, you know, early 17th century before word processors and computers and this and that. And, you know, imagine typesetting this whole page by hand and then doing it over and over and over again for every page in the Bible you're going to make inadvertent mistakes. It's just going to happen, right? So the designations he, she, give the mistaken impression that this is the only variant between them. The, uh, in fact, one can rarely find two pages between them exactly identical, 
and textual differences between them likely number in the thousands, mostly due to, um, now this, he's using a different catalog code. So this would be the, let me just make sure I get this right. I believe he's talking in that code. Yes, he's talking about the She Bible. Um, due to mostly the She Bible being very poorly done. Third, the designations give the mistaken impression that one can tell something about a given copy based on whether it has he or she in the relevant spot in Luke 3.15. This is not true. Because there is a variant in Hebrew text here, editions of the King James Bible for centuries could swap the readings at this passage. Okay, So we kind of talked about that, right? Um, I think the she, she reading is the correct reading, in my opinion. It makes the most sense when you read it in English. And I, I'm, doubt, I'm doubtful of arguments that say that the King James translators intentionally changed she to he. Let me recap. The reading in English had been she all the way through, all the way through to the, the bishops. The 1602 bishops had that. There's no evidence in Bod 1602 that the translators changed it, okay? Um, so if it was changed by them, it was changed late in the game, and we have no record of why or what their thinking was about changing it, and then later editions changed it. Even modern printings, even modern Bibles, the ESV, the New American Standard, and others will sh will have it read she. The ESV, as I showed you, reads she, and she do and, and doesn't even have a footnote uh, about the issue. And then he gives a fourth reason here. Fourth, listing this way instead of simply first edition and second edition has been, has been capitalized on by a number of sellers who sell full copies or loose pages of the first edition King James, usually at exorbitant prices, and then they add a footnote or small print she variant or something like it. Actually, this is ab absolutely not a first edition, but these romanticized titles and lack of clarity make this possible. So I think Berg brings up an interesting point here about how continuing to maintain these romantic distinctions of he, she, as though they're both first editions, or both coming from 1611, has created some um, interesting tactics, let's say, for people to sell stuff online where they can capitalize on some of these things, okay? So anybody selling a 1611, it has to be a folio size because that's the only size it was printed in 1611, all right? Now, somebody gave me this as a gift, and it says, this is what it says on here, okay? It says, an original leaf from the first edition of the 1611 King James Bible printed before 1650. I'm just going to say that that's confusing. Is this a 1611 leaf or is it not? I was maybe naively, maybe stupidly under the impression that this was a 1611 leaf. But then I go to the back to the affidavit of originality and it says in June 1999, a first edition of the 1611 King James Pulpit Bible sold for over $350,000 at Solsby's Auction House in New York. Even the smaller quarto size printings done prior to 1650 are intend, uh, and intended for private ownership rather than church pulpit use, of which this leaf is an example. So this is not a 1611 leaf. In fact, there's no date on exactly what where this is coming from. The only thing that they will certify here is that this is th at least 300 years old, probably between 1650. But notice what it said, an original leaf from the first edition of the King James Bible. I'm going to say to you that that is less than clear, possibly a little bit dishonest and disingenuine, so I'm thinking here all this time that I have an original leaf of a 1611. And this is from, what is this from? Uh, this is from Isaiah. This is not an original leaf. This is a folio. This is a quarto size. You see the size difference? So my point is, I think Timothy Berg is right, that there are people that are capitalizing on the naivete of people not knowing about these things out there on the internet to make money. 
And unfortunately, that's the case. And people will sell things as original she Bibles or original he Bibles and charge a lot of money for them. And people who who haven't studied these things, they maybe are taken in by some of this stuff. And I, I, I do think that it needs to be stopped uh, for those reasons. Okay, so what have we seen? We have seen that there's a text that we have seen that there's a debate of how many editions originate from 1611. The debate is compounded by the she he Bible controversy. The he Bible was the first edition from 1611. The she Bible was a second folio edition from 1613. The notes go through that in great detail. But that still leaves the question then of how many printings of the He Bible from 1611 were there. How many printings were there? Okay. There was at least two printings. Okay. So, having settled the He She Bible controversy, we can now direct our attention to assessing how many different printings of the 1611 were issued, okay? Given the data, it is reasonable to assume that there were at least two printings of the folio-sized Bible in 1611. Once again, Brother Timothy Berg has helped us immensely by synthesizing the information in his yet unpublished essay on this topic, okay? Now, we only have time in this video to look at maybe two examples here, okay? But there are examples of variance between different 1611 printings, okay? of the he bible so one example is exodus 21 26 some have them some have him song of songs 2 7 has he for she another typo so there's another example of a he for she confused printer first esdras uh, 558 has setters forward for uh setters forward for setters forward and the margin of 2 Maccabees 440 has Tyrannus for Tyrannus for Tyrannus. So clearly a spelling difference, okay? So here we have a, things in a list. There are a couple of these, though, that I want to zero in on, all right? The first one is related here to Exodus chapter 14. Look at verse 10, all right? So there's a discrepancy in some of the printings. I don't know why that is that crazy. Okay, here we go. Notice verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Notice how there is a line and a phrase that is repeated there twice verbatim. Okay? So th so that that printing, this printing of the 1611 has that phrase twice. Now we can go to uh Exodus chapter 14 verse 10. Let's do that. And we can see that there is clearly a printer error there because the line is added twice. So let's go to the King James. So we're going to be looking at the standard 1769 text here when we do this. Come on. And we can see that there's a line added there. So one of the print errors or print discrepancies in the different editions of the 1611 is in this verse. Here's Exodus 14.10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. But when you look at this here in the 1611, you can see that that phrase is repeated, thereby adding an additional three lines. Okay. Now, I don't have a picture of this one. I can't find one online. But there is another printing of the 1611 that takes this out, takes out the repeated phrase, and they literally leave a space gap so that the end of this page ends at the same spot. Okay, so in 1611, there were clearly two printings of the He Bible, to say it that way, 
and one of them is trying to fix things or mistakes that were made in the first one. And in this verse, there's a gap left there so that that verse begins and ends at the same page so they don't have to redo the whole rest of the page, okay? So there are a few other things that we, let's just look at one more example here. For this one, we'll go to Mark, uh, I believe it's chapter 8, verse 33, okay? So here's one example here. Look at verse 33 and look at the end of the line here, okay? But the things that be of men, and you can see that this verse ends now on an additional line. And then we start verse 34 here that then carries on to the next page, okay? Now, there's some interesting things here that I've never noticed uh, about the 1611. Um, like, this is a little strange to me. Like, why does this 34 here? And then we just carry on to the next page. But I, I haven't noticed stuff like that until I've been looking specifically at the 1611 as an artifact. Now, I have in my library the original 1611 King James New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, a photographic reproduction of the original. Okay. Now, the image that I have on the screen right now is from the King James Bible Online.org website, and you can see that the word men is on this line, the next line down. Okay. This picture is taken from the Bible here that I have the photographic reproduction of the original, and you'll notice the bottom of the line, and the word men is not there. So let me just show you, okay? I know I got my video window up, but you see men at the bottom of the line? Then you look at the picture here, and you see men. It's not at the bottom of the line. It ends on the line there. So this is another example of a, ch of a printer change that happened in 1611, as there was a second printing of the He Bible. So we can see that, and we can conclude, and let's go back to my notes, from all of this, the following statement. The available evidence points strongly in the direction that there were two different printings of the folio edition in 1611. The second edition, so-called She Bible, Changing the reading in Ruth 315 dates from 1613. And the rest of the evidence presented in the notes here, I think, make that extremely clear. So in 1611, there were at, there were two printings of the text in folio size. One trying to fix some of the errors of the first. Most notably, a change in Mark 3, sorry, Mark 8, verse 33, like I can show you here, okay? And then another example is from Exodus chapter uh, 14, verse 10. And then there are other more other examples here that are listed in differences between them here in the notes um, for you to consider. So this video has been done to try to fill in the gap of the lost video. And I have actually done a few things in this video that I didn't do in church and shown a, a few extra things. So I hope that this has been interesting to you. And again, I commend read, read the notes in the description for the video because they go into a much more detail explaining things, uh, noting the different scholars who have commented on the he, she Bible controversy, explaining what their reasons were. Um, but I'm, I'm convinced to my satisfaction of the following. Number one, there were two printings in 1611 of the so-called He Bible. Number two, the she so-called She Bible is a second folio edition from 1613. I see no reason to think that the reading He in Ruth 315 was the intentional choice of the translators. And I think the second folio edition of 1613 fixed what seems to me to be a printer error. All the Bibles, all the English Bibles leading up to the King James said she in Ruth 315. And even modern versions read she. She is what makes the text make sense given the context of what goes before and what follows Ruth chapter 3, verse 15, particularly in verse 16, 
like I tried to show you in this video. So Sunday, we're going to move on with uh, Lesson 190, where we start looking at the King James Bible as a historical artifact and the preliminary material that's in it. Uh, so we're going to spend some time looking at it and uh, studying it for what was included. And I also want to say, be careful when you're buying stuff online, um, whether it's loose leafs or other things, make sure, do your due diligence to make sure you're getting what you're buying and what you're paying for. Because I think there is some advertising, et cetera, that's a little bit sketchy. Um, so we appreciate you watching this video. Next week, we hope to make another video responding or giving our thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective. Appreciate you tuning in. If you like, if you like the videos on our channel, please like them, leave a comment, share our channel, subscribe, ring the alarm bell, tell other people about this channel uh, so that you could stay current with the ministry here of Grace Life Bible Church. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you have never come to a place where you've acknowledged your sin before Almighty God, and you have reached out in faith to a Redeemer who died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood in payment for your sin, satisfied the offended justice of God by dying in your place as a substitute and taking your rightful punishment upon himself, dying on the cross, being buried, and raising from the dead three days later. You need to trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only total complete payment for your sin. Do it today, please, before it's everlasting too late. Happy New Year, and we'll see you in the next video.